on to the workshop on recipes for effective online teaching, curated videos plus activities. Oh, sorry, it's okay. Um, I'm Nima Salahi. I'm an instructional designer for the School of Nursing, and I'm co-presenting today with Susan Tay. Uh, our online monitor is Peg Shervin. She's an academic technology coordinator for the AHC and one of the sponsors of this workshop today. Welcome everyone, and I hope you all got a handout uh, for the online audience. The handout is linked in the email that was sent out to you, as well as on the calendar invitation. So welcome to everyone, and let's get started. Thanks, Nima. Um, I want to introduce myself. My name is Susan Tade. I'm with Academic Technology Support Services, which is part of OIT. And um, my background is in media production. And so uh, one of the things that is very passionate to me is creating effective videos. And so one of the things we're going to be talking about today is uh, our recipes for effective online teaching. So uh, Nima and I got the opportunity to present this at a conference a few weeks ago. And so we are excited to present it to you as well. Um, we want to sh talk with you about the fact that research shows us that recording hours of video lectures for online or flipped classes is really an ineffective online te teaching resource. And studies show us that students are simply not watching those long videos. Um, it takes a significant amount of our time as the creators uh, to um, create those video presentations. And we don't want your time wasted, your time and energy. So we want to give you some um, input on how to make more effective videos. So today, we are going to highlight the key research on the types of videos um, that you should be creating. We're going to identify for you some strategies that you can use to create focused video content. And we're going to provide you with some suggested student activities that you can do prior to during and after uh, students watch your course videos. Mm -hmm. So that, that can ensure greater student engagement and uh, deeper learning. So as we mentioned earlier, all of the things that we're going to cover today is research-based. And so we're going to be sharing with you the, that research information at the end of this session. Um, we're going to provide you with all the articles that we use so that you can do further investigations on your own. Um, but I'm going to first start out by talking with you about uh, two frameworks that came up repeatedly in that research. And so we're going to start there, and then we'll move on to some of our, our suggested strategies. Okay. So we have to move on. They're asking if we can boost the volume a little. I don't know if it's the audio volume. We adjust the microphone down a bit. I'll ask Mike. This oh. microphone isn't being used. Oh, okay. At all? Okay. I think and that, that doesn't impact the I'll, I'll ask Mike to. You want me to run out there? I can run out there. Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, so we're going to start with talking about measuring cognitive load. Um, according to Cynthia Bram, who is an assistant director of teaching and learning at Vanderbilt University and a senior lecturer for biology in, at Vanderbilt, one of the primary considerations when constructing educational material, materials, including video, is cognitive load. And this is in a research article that's one of the um, items that we are going to be talking about significantly. But let's take a step back and make sure that we all know what we mean by cognitive load. Um, any learning experience has three components. It's intrinsic load, germane load, and extraneous load. So the intrinsic load is the inherent level of difficulty that's associated with the specific instructional topic. Okay? And it's also like the prior connections or lack of prior connections that the student has that can either help or hinder their learning. Okay, so that's the intrinsic load. The germane load is actually the level of activity uh, needed for learning to occur. And then the extraneous load is the information or input that really doesn't need to be there. It kind of hinders our learning, right? So our big takeaway here, our big conclusion is that we, as the creators of this content, need to consider intrinsic load. What do our students know and how much processing power is it going to need for them to actually learn this concept? Um, how do we promote germane load in terms of them being able to process the information? And um, when we're designing the presentations, how can we limit the extra stuff, extraneous stuff that really isn't necessary? So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about cognitive load. Um, the next framework, I'm doing laptops here, 
uh, we're going to talk about uh, creating long-term memory. And building on the cognitive load theory, we looked at the two, uh, and we looked at the current research on you know, how to create effective video lectures. And all of this current research that we examined referenced the cognitive theory of multimedia learning. And this was originally put forth by Mayer in 2003. And within this framework, we can really kind of develop strategies to move forward, um, to move student understanding from sensory memory to working memory to long-term memory. And I'm going to take a step back here. Um, these are oh, these things can help people create online us as the creators of the presentations, and we can create make better decisions on how to select and process the information and the content that we want to put forth. So. Sensory memory has two channels. It's got the uh, visual channel and it's got the auditory channel. And if you can enhance your, in, in, you can enhance learning if you can combine within your presentation both of those channels in the learning process. Okay. Working memory is where students actually process this information, and it is this is where we kind of select and focus what we're going to be able to uh, process. There's a limited capacity of working um, for us to input in working memory, so we need to be very selective on our content. And that's one of the things we're going to be talking about moving forward. But this is here where we need to consider what our learning objectives are and our assessments in order to determine what needs to actually be included, and then what can we cut out? What can reduce extraneous load? So instructional de designers often use this concept in backward design technique when they're doing course design. But ultimately, the goal for us as the instructors, actually for instructors and for students, is to create this long-term memory. Because long-term memory, long memory occurs when, occurs when short-term memory activities are combined with active learning, which Nima is going to talk about early, uh, later, and it really can solidify the learning. But shorter, more focused presentations or lectures combined with strategic active learning can really create that long-term memory. So, what are we actually talking about in terms of items that we really want to move forward? Okay, here we're getting into our recipe metaphor. Okay, because we really want to um, be able to trim content. In order to keep students engaged, that's what we really need to do. We need to create shortened video lectures. Um, one of the other researchers, Gao, who actually did a substantial quantitative research of MOOCs um, in 2014, there was over 130,000 students and uh, millions of views, um, and they were able to substantiate all of the things that we're going to be talking about here. As the creator of these videos, you really need to invest some time in pre-production. You need to really keep focused on what the key content is. We're going to talk about that repeatedly. But what are some of the pre-production effort that you can do? You can talk about, you can really need to outline the content of what you're going to be covering in the video. What can do, uh, you can create a script. What, why do you do that? It keeps you focused. You are the expert. You know everything about this topic and you want to share that, all that information with your students. But what do your students really need to know in order to get farther down the road in terms of learning that? So keeping you focused on that content using an outline or a script uh, really does make it easier for you when you're creating the video. Uh, we recommend that the videos be three to uh, six minutes um, in length. Um, after 10 minutes, it, it viewing drops significantly. And uh, we are going to tell you uh, much more statistics about that. Um, but also, the short videos really do increase the student's opportunity to do their post-viewing activities. So you're going to get more engagement. If, they, if you keep them short. You need to be talking about, you know, and I, I think I've, I've said this before already, you need to eliminate any excess information or distractors to it, um, avoid cognitive load. So what you're doing is you're weeding. You're weeding out content that you don't really need. And you need to um, curate and focus information that's relevant to the learning goals so that then you're enhancing the germane load of the cognitive load theory. Okay, and um, you will need to explicitly create a one-on-one -on -one relationship from the uh, learning content to the learning goal. The students need to know why they're watching this video. 
then they will stay engaged if they know that there's an investment for them. Um, Carmichael and uh, his group of people in uh, 2018 from Purdue substantiate this very much um, in their uh, research article. Students want shorter videos and they're going to be more engaged in their online lecture and participate in follow-up activities. And right here at the University of Minnesota, a study of this was done as well by Brothen in 2017. And they found that students, on average, watched less than 40% of the videos. So key recommendation, keep it short, keep it relevant, and make sure that the students know why that they are um, investing their time in watching these videos. Okay. We also want to talk about, um, well, I want to go back to this uh, sensory memory. Um, concept that we talked about. We want to mix in clear cues for the student so that we they know uh, the, the, the sensory memory using those dual channels really does enhance their learning. So if it can be verbal and visual, that um, is a, a great way to actually um, kind of uh, signal to the student that this is what's important. Okay? So you can use symbols, you can use text, you can highlight animation, moving things around like that. Those are the kinds of things that make the student realize, oh yeah, this is really important. This is what I really want to grasp onto. So use those kinds of cues to make sure that the students know what they need to do. It really does help the novice learners understand what's important. Okay? The sweetening of the pot is, this is kind of like this, um, what really makes a, a really great engaging video is really um, an engaged instructor. You, as the instructor, need to have a very strong presence in the video. So some people recommend, you know, screencast recording of your screen. Really, students want to see you as the expert. They want to know who you are. And so a headshot of you starting and talking in the video, you don't have to be on the whole time, but as long as you, uh, the students know that you are the expert, you're, you're giving them this information, and it will really... Um, keep them engaged longer. Um, it doesn't have to be on all the time, as I said, but they also, uh, it is actually uh, more engaged if it's a more informal tone. A stoic, very stern kind of re um, presentation is not very engaging and warm. If you can speak to your students almost like it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation, then it, it's actually more engaging and easier to for them to actually listen to. So you have to kind of get used to and I'm looking at my laptop here, talking down into my camera, but I'm also using a lot of expression in my face and in my hands. Those are the kinds of things that will keep your students engaged um, and want them to actually continue to watch the video. Um, other and very, very important keys of effective delivery is good audio. <coughs> So make sure you have a good microphone when you're doing any of these recordings because if you don't have good audio, they're not going to watch the video. It's just too distracting. Um, you also need to speak clearly and with energy. Um, and movement actually is an enhancement as well. So those are the kinds of key things that are all substantiated with all of our research um, of the things that you should do to um, create effective videos. What we want to do now is get you thinking a little bit. So what have you, what have we covered so far? Um, and what I want you to just take one minute to write down right by there by yourself two things that, we, that have resonated with you so far, okay? And then I want you to share with your neighbor what, what is, you know, one of the things, the two things that, that you've talked about. You online, I love to want you to post your thoughts in the chat and then read through the other posts of the other folks. And Peg, our uh, monitor there, is going to be chatting with you all, and we'll be highlighting back to the rest of us uh, some of the insights from the online group. Okay, one minute. Okay. Hey. Hi. Can you just come in here and already have scoops and tables and stuff? I know. Yeah. Cut it down. So then, I like the visuals. Yeah. Isn't it great? And so I can't even 
but it's going to help the kids. Yeah. Even if they're like, I do a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I know. I wrote it down to like, this is if you're talking to the second one. Like, you're in front of a thousand. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Pearl. Pearl. Yeah. Uh, so do you have they posted comments? Yes, I've got one, two, three, four, or five comments. Okay, great. Can you pick out one or two of the most interesting ones so that we can yeah. the rest? They're kind of quite uh, a few of them are pretty much the same. So okay. Okay, so now we would like to hear your feedback a little bit. Is it, does anybody want to share anything that resonated really big with them so far? Yeah. Anybody want to share? What's the what you talked about? Yeah, we liked the dual, the visual and the audio. Right. Neither of us are audio. We just tune out. Someone talks to us for a long time. <laughs> so I like the visual piece that goes with it. And then we liked the short and sweet, but to a point, because we're dealing with content that do you want your student to know a sound bite, or do you want them to really understand what they're doing? And if they're taking care of me as I age, I want my student to know why they're wearing that <laughs> med, not that, oh, I use this med now. Uh -huh. Why? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? So it's a fine line, and just some give and take. Balance. Mm -hmm. Balance. So we also talked about the need just to be, you know, real and authentic um, right. when you're when you're doing these things. So it just doesn't sound dry. Yeah. Boring. Right. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily easy to do. No, it's so, not. It's not. <laughs> yeah. I know. I know. I know. I, we liked your use of, you know, just think of yourself talking one to one to right. a person, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that kind of helps that presence and often. often um, one old technique that we used many years ago was we'd actually put a picture of someone we really liked next to the camera, mm -hmm. so that would enforce a so, smile at that point. Yeah. You know, and it really it does work. Yeah, and then you can think about them. You know, as yeah. you're speaking. Yeah. So, um, I I was what really hit me was the the cognitive load and, and the intrinsic part, and maybe you could elaborate on it. Um, is the intrinsic part also like the stuff that they already know? Yes. And so how do you as a faculty or putting these courses together, how, I guess, how do you measure that before you even get started? And I'm assuming that then the cognitive load, those intrinsic pieces are, some of that cognitive load has nothing to do with what you're trying to teach them anyway. <laughs> yeah. So it depends on what their semester looks like. So those are things that I try to really think about when helping faculty with that is, you know, this is just one course as right. opposed to the other four that they have, and where are they at? So, I don't that, know. That's a real struggle. I couldn't agree with you more. And, you know, every student is going to come with different prior knowledge. And so it's a real balance. So maybe, it, and, and that's where you can maybe engage with students you know, in an offline area or in, a, in an area where they can come to you should they not have the knowledge that they need. You know, but it, it is, it's really, it's really a challenge. So, Amy, any thoughts on that? Well, I, I think that, that we have a number of faculty who address this regularly. So maybe, uh, Mary, did you want to address well, that? I was just going to say to Becky, I, I think in some ways, be it fair or not, we make some assumptions. You know, like yeah. if I'm teaching a course, and I know that it has a prerequisite course, so they would have had to take like one or two other things coming into my course in preparation. I am making the assumption they covered those things pretty well and they remember them. Yeah. Now, probably, truth is, not everyone does. And so really it's only through kind of getting into the course you start to realize maybe that someone needs some remediation a bit. It's right. Help. But so I think sometimes it's those assumptions that we make based on prerequisite stuff they had that came. 
And I can tell you that in pharmacotherapeutics, they take pharmacology in all semester and pharmacotherapeutics in spring, and you assume that they know all this stuff because it's pretty fresh. Yeah. But we learned over the years that that's not necessarily true. Yeah. So we were putting, kind of reviewing, and now what we've started to do is say, this is review material, so those who need it can go use it if they want, yeah. but the focus is here on the application piece. That's helped somewhat, yeah. but it still looks pretty overwhelming when yeah. you look at all those things. So right. I tried to be put a little note out, you know, only do these things if you feel you need the review, but even that is, mm -hmm. they see it and they're like, ugh. You know? And I was thinking more like having them being overloaded with that kind of intrinsic material. Like if they've done a lot of prerequisites mm -hmm. and they still they have all this intrinsic material before this course, mm -hmm. and you're trying to get uh, maybe a, I don't know. You're teaching a different set of uh, different material and whatnot, mm -hmm. but that mm -hmm. that preloaded intrinsic mm -hmm. is kind of getting in the way. I guess. Yeah. I yeah. Yeah. So yeah. a lot of cognitive load studies, what they're showing now is that students. We often feel like we really need to load or preload or offer other things on the side. And what they're showing is that if you're teaching them certain analytical skills, even if you're not teaching them everything they need to know, especially for uh, courses like nursing or med school, if you're not teaching them everything, if you actually reduce the content that you have, but you include analytical skills in that, that students tend to do better on their uh, certification exams. And uh, even if they haven't covered the ex that all that other material, that they still do better mm -hmm. than if you try to include right. everything. So when so you... Because kind of, like, they learn to analyze. Halfway to get to that material. Right, almost like uh, creating like a, a, a... Helping them learn in your course. Learn kind of learn. A way to critically right. think through right. things. Yeah. Yeah. How, to, how to be able to... Um, so, kind of wa almost yeah. walking through like a, a framework, so to speak, yeah. Yeah. that helps them decide things about what they're learning and make analytical, you know, judgments about things. And it, sometimes in doing that, hopefully you hope yeah. that they can generalize that to something else, that they'll say, okay, I think I'm going to walk through this the same way I did this thing I know. Right. I'm going to see how far I can get on something that's right. new. So I think it's kind of more like that, where it's a frame, mental framework of how do you approach to a problem. Yeah, how do you, how do you problem solve and what are the steps you would take? So you have a question? Uh, it is sort of a, a question. Um, <laughs> it goes to the statement at the beginning that this is based on evidence. Mm -hmm. Yes. And therefore, generalizability. Mm -hmm. And if we keep that in mind, we get to where I'm going. Um, We've already stated students are not homogeneous. Yes. Mm -hmm. So is this data based on primarily undergraduate, graduate, postgraduate, all oh, of the above? All of the above. So we have some studies. So Carmichael, the one that recently published, I think that was 2018. 2018. Yeah. He, what they did is their team of researchers, they went through 259 research studies done since 2013 to present. And they looked at every single one of them, and they're coming up with the same results. So this is very, very replicable research. And they're, they're finding that whether this is MOOCs, online MOOCs that have millions of people that are coming in and out, and that are not like our, our, um, our more stable body of higher learning. And they're finding that with undergrads and with graduate students, and amazingly, because there's almost no research that is that replicable, where you can take all these diverse bodies of, of participants. And they're finding that they're all not watching the videos. <laughs> One, you have to have really short videos. So, and, and that when they, as the videos shorten, students will um, not only watch them, but they'll do follow-up activities. So that's how a lot of the research uh, studies define engagement, because engagement is one of those terms like, okay, what are you calling an engagement? So what they're finding is, is that engagement means they're watching it, number one, and two, are they doing follow-up activities? The one that they did at the U of M, which was a huge study, that was for undergrad uh, psychology courses, where the videos were required, and they're looking actually, one was uh, in class and three was online, and they're looking at 300 and some students. And they were finding that the students were watching between 20 to 40 percent of the videos mm. uh, of, 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 of each video. 
And these were required videos for this course. It wasn't optional videos. So these were required videos. They're watching that much. And, it is, and they also looked at learning outcomes. And they saw that it did not impact learning outcomes, whether they watched them or not. So that's the question. Yeah, ouch. <laughs> so. So if I, can, if I can summarize what I think I heard. Yeah. Since I'm in the nursing school, I use the example. Yeah. While the cognitive load would be different, mm -hmm. um, the general approach would otherwise be the same for a doctor, a nurse practitioner, uh, yes. a registered nurse, an undergrad, a, a nurse, undergrad, an yeah. undergraduate, and a pre-nursing uh, student. Yes. It's just the cognitive loads would obviously be different. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But otherwise, yes. what I, what the I prior knowledge would be different. Is short, focus, pertinent content mm -hmm. right. applies to yes. each group and with an energetic, personable instructor in each case. Yes, and there's also been research done which has compared how students view, uh, that's a very nice summary, which <laughs> shows how students view videos done by, let's say, professionals' videos done by some of these companies that are now doing yes. content mm -hmm. uh, videos, and your own instructor. Right. And they did a, one research study where they showed that um, it was exact same comment, content, exact same script by the presenter. And the students consistently rated the one done by their own instructor as higher. Wow. Oh. Which you have to think, that's a professional person right. doing that, presenting that content. So, but students are saying it's significantly, reading it significantly higher when it's their own instructor. They're more invested when it's their own instructor. Yeah. There's a relationship. Exactly. So, we so off back to that, just one quick question, that study that showed videos, watching the video made no impact on learning. Did they, what factors did make an impact on learning? They found that other uh, active learning activities other made it. Made it yeah. Yeah, we're going to get there. Okay. <laughs> but we did not, we did not go ask crazy anything from the online people, and it would be nice to hear uh, a couple of their statements as well. So from the online people, Peg, could you? Okay. Okay. So one thing Laura just said was it's all about relationship, and that's in response to your last professional uh, video versus senior own instructor. I'm hearing that, I'm hearing that echo in my Okay, and, okay, and then the other very similar, very similar to what Nick said, said um, um, basically, basically short, short you know, under, you know, six, under minutes, six minutes, trying to keep trying that, to keep that personal, personal, energetic, energetic presentation. presentation. No. Real and authentic. Real and authentic. Okay. So very nice summary, thank Great. you. Yeah. Okay, Nima. Okay, um, so, so once you have your video lectures, they're nicely curated, they're shortened um, so that uh, you've enhanced learner engagement, you've deepened learning. So what's next? What are the other activities that we just talked about that will help you with uh, actually making this an active learning activity? First of all, uh, you, want to, you want to provide, as you can see, we have blueberries and chocolate chips. And the blueberries are the pre-video watching activities. And uh, those activities, what are they going to do? They're going to provide frameworks for your students. First of all, uh, what kind of activities would those be? Uh, aligning them with your learning objectives. We talked about backward design. But making sure that whatever activity that you're having them do aligns with your learning objective. Or even very openly say, this, this video will help you, and then some kind of language that will align it with your learning objective. Um, Tell them how, how it's relevant to the rest of the course material or the material in that module. Uh, tell them how it relates to their careers. Making it relevant for your students is going to engage them more. And this would not necessarily be in the video. This would be on the page right before they watch the video. So you've got your online page and you're saying, watch this video and here is why you should be watching this video and then you would have your video link. So providing students with guiding questions before they watch the video. Here are some questions to think about as you're watching this video on dot, dot, dot. Um, that's going to help them process the video as well. Even a quick 
outline of what they might see in the video. Another thing that you can do is tell them before they take the video, first of all, how much time they're going to be spending, uh, which is going to impact how much of a video they're going to watch and, and what kind of time they set aside to watch it. But also tell them before they watch the video what kind of activities they'll be doing after. That immediately, that, and they've done research studies on this too, that immediately makes them focus more. They become more mindful and they learn more of the video if they know what they're supposed to focus on when they're watching the video. So uh, guiding questions, an outline, what you want them to get out of the video, all of this helps them focus. And if they know that there's going to be a follow-up quiz, even if that quiz doesn't cover everything in the video, you might have five questions in your quiz. You might have three questions in your quiz. It might be a follow-up discussion. Uh, there are lots of different things you can do, but knowing that they have some kind of follow-up activity immediately enhances their ability to focus on the content and learn it. Um, so pre-video watching frameworks provide context for the student. In-video activities. If you're looking at in-video activities, there's lots of different ways to do that as well. So they don't have to include complex questions or even more than one question. So assuming if you, if you have a six minute uh, video, you do not need to do in video questions. But if you're going up to 10 minutes or 12 minutes, let's, hopefully, let's hope it's not going to be longer than that. Uh, but if you're going up to 10 or 12 minutes, you can have in the middle, you can have a slide with a question on it. And so I'd like you to pause now and think about what we've just covered in the first uh, five slides or in the first few slides. It doesn't even have to be done with any kind of complex technology. You can do it with complex technology. There, there are software programs up the, out there, but you can do it with something like if you're using VoiceThread, just put a slide in the middle and just pause and say, I'd like you to think for a few minutes. Mary, you do that with some of your videos where you just tell the students, I want you to just stop and think for a minute. And so you can just, it can be very low tech, right in the middle of your thing, just say, stop and think, we've covered this, this, and this. I want you to pause this video and just write down some ideas of what you've, of what you've learned. So it can be something that low tech. Um, or you can use things like Screencast-O-Matic or Kaltura. Again, VoiceThread, Screencast-O-Matic, and Kaltura are all centrally licensed by the University of Minnesota. Uh, VoiceThread, uh, uh, voice you can also ask them to post little comments around that middle, middle slide. And so in that way, Anything that's going to make it active learning, that's going to make them stop and process. It can be a passive, a more passive process where they're just reflecting, or it can be something where right in the middle of that presentation, they're engaging with other students on that voice thread, or they're clicking and doing a little uh, in-video question on Kaltura or Screencast-O-Matic. So there are different ways that you can do in-video questions. It doesn't necessarily have to be a quiz question. It can be something they reflect on. It can be a little summary that you do. It's a pause. And remember that your students are novice learners. They're not you. They don't know how to put frames around the content you've just given them. So what you want to do is provide those frameworks, both visually, with your, with your narration, with pre-activities, and with in-video activities. Um, and finally, I changed it on this one. And finally, you want to do post-video activities. And post-video activities can span the gamut of all the different activities that you might be doing in your course. Again, that's not necessarily in the video. That might be on your page, where you're linking to a quiz, you're linking to a discussion, you're asking them to do a quick reflection assignment. I'm sure that if you think about it, you can come up with half a dozen different things that students can do post video that you've had them watch. So that, again, you're promoting uh, active learning. Anything that, produces, anything that produces opportunities for students to review, reflect, analyze, will take it from uh, that temporary, that, uh, that, that short-term learning into long-term learning. If they're not processing it in some way, they are not getting deeper learning. So when we have, again, that goes back to why do we want to shorten our videos? Because we want to give our students time 
to process that video. So if we shorten the content, but then add in active learning, you're giving students time to do what you want them to do, which is become a more analytical learner and to, to retain that information long term. So very quickly, I'd like to um, ask uh, you to just think for a second of what are the kinds of activities that you do, maybe in class, and how would that apply to online, that you would give students for a post-video uh, activity to help them deepen their learning. And you can... Um, I used to start every module with a case sort of hook them in. I'm finding that Canvas is perhaps, how do I want to say that, <laughs> less versatile. Mm -hmm. And so we're struggling with some of that. Mm -hmm. We still have, uh, these are the topics we're going to cover in this module. These are some of the terms you need to know. These are the learning objectives. And then there's a grid that says these are the readings, these are the presentations, these are the interactive activities, this is the quiz, these are the takeaways. But I, you know, I tried in Canvas putting that case up front, and then people were like, I don't get it. <laughs> what do I do with this case? And I was just saying, this is to introduce the module to sort of hook you in, which used to work really well, I found. And now all of a sudden, they are like, why do we have to do this? Well, we, we don't have to do this. this is, we'll come back to it, but it's a way to hook you in. Mm -hmm. So I don't know... In general, we've found some difficulties with Canvas. The threaded discussions doesn't really work. Mm -hmm. so most of my students are now doing Google discussions and linking it in, mm -hmm. which um, is messy at best. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because you, you get a thing to your email about this, this, this. It's not. I like going into the course and seeing what mm -hmm. people are doing, responding there. And then you're like, I just feel it's fragmented. And I don't know if there's a way to clean up that thread of discussion. Sure, sure. Way. So we should reconnect mm -hmm. and take a look at that and look at the design of that. I think that we can probably find some things that you'd like a lot. So going back, so what activities, those were some examples. Yeah. What are some other activities that you use to frame your online lectures that you think are maybe effective, maybe something you've seen in some of your courses? Or is there anything online that anyone's come up with? Laura Kirk suggested discussion and quizzes. Discussion and quizzes. So that's worked well for her. And I'll offer something. Uh huh. Um, the framework I work from here is is basically journal work. I'm an editor in a journal, and a, and your your pre-video for me is the abstract mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the in video is the paper and then the uh, post activity is a lot of different potential things mm -hmm. um, but the reason I spoke up was the uh, pre-video or the abstract when I read an abstract I demand or the paper is not going to get published mm -hmm. uh, the what which you brought up. Mm -hmm. You answered the, for me, the third one, the how. You said this is going to be based on evidence, mm -hmm. um, references, and other material. Um, I'm not sure I heard, and it may be that I'm just hard of hearing, but for me, it's the what, why. Why the hell do I want to take my valuable time mm -hmm. and participate in this, mm -hmm. whatever it is? Mm -hmm. Why am I going to read this paper beyond this abstract mm -hmm. is the why. Mm -hmm. And that has to be in the pre-video, in my opinion. The what, the why, mm -hmm. and the how. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, and you do it enthusiastically, mm -hmm. I mean, most people are going to at least get into the video instead of shutting it off. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a very nice way of framing it. I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. Yes? Pam Goddess is saying, ask them to, to think of one or two questions regarding what they just viewed or a one-minute reflection. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So those are another good examples mm -hmm. of what faculty are using. Anything else that you guys wanted to add that you've seen maybe in your courses or that you think worked fairly well? 
I do like putting them in smaller groups when they're in large classes. Mm -hmm. they discuss within the group. Mm -hmm. That seems mm -hmm. to be a more effective way to engage. Yes, yes. Then their voice be, it becomes more relevant, mm -hmm. and what they contribute becomes more important. True. Anything else before we move on? I just wanted to put that little uh, taste or that little excitement out there about this in-video quizzing. That's a new feature that we're going to have within Kaltura pretty soon. So yeah. something within new that I think will be helpful. Kaltura, you said? Yeah, it's, um, we don't have access to it quite yet, but it's coming soon. Yeah. Because, uh, yeah, because I, as, as you were talking about these things, I think I'd benefit from having, whether it's one-to-one -one or whether you have a course or a workshop or something, but both Kaltura, um, if we're going to get that new feature. And then also, I've not used screencast, and I'd like to kind of learn and walk through that with people. Yeah, I use that all the time. I love it. So okay, I've not used it. Easier to use, <laughs> and you like it better than like VoiceThread? Yeah. No. Okay. Much quicker. It's a, it's a good tool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and the nice thing about that is these are all licensed centrally. Mm -hmm. So then you have tech support for uh, both the faculty and for students if they want to use it as well. Do you know when that um, tool is going to be available? You know, I thought it was going to be like before spring semester, but I'm not sure. I, would hope I think it's in the test environment right now. I would now. hope it would be launched this, this summer. By okay. summer. That's and so it would be part of the presentation that you, you'd have some capacity. In fact, I'm envisioning you can like pause or stop and then enter those questions. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, yeah it's, literally, it's literally embedded. That'd be so as it's nice. going, it's a pause, then you, you it comes up on the screen. Yeah, I've played with it in the test environment. It's very quick and easy to use for faculty. And uh, you can also change it and edit it out. So let's say one semester you use a question, you don't like it, it's not working well, as so many of our materials. Uh, and I assume these would be kind of formative quizzes. I mean, they, they, they aren't in the environment where you'd be worried about test security and stuff. This is really They're not about, integrated. It, it's, so it's, it's not it's, yeah. the results. Yeah. Okay. So it's really so just for their learning, learning and yes. uh, so engagement. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I've never learned Kel or never, I don't know how to use Kel I haven't used Kel I've never used it. Oh, but you have Jenna, don't you? you? And I'd be happy to work with you on that too. Okay. okay. We okay. also have an upcoming presentation on, on the media okay. for the school of nursing good. as well. Okay. And we're also developing a new training packet on uh, Kaltura. Yeah. That will be launched soon too. That would be through, through, through Central. 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 Okay. okay. Great. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's very quick and easy to use. and. Um, and there are lots of different ways to get trained up on it. Okay. So, um, so to summarize, what happens when you curate your video? This is part of the why, also for why we're at, we're saying that you should do this. When you shorten online lectures, you get more focused content. This is easier for students to review and learn, and much easier for faculty to update from year to year. So we are advocating this not only because we think that students will watch it more, which is evident from the research, but also because for you as faculty, you're putting a lot of time and effort into it. You should put a time and effort into something students will watch. And that means that it's going to, if you do shortened videos, you know what they're watching. They're going to be doing it. So this uh, means more current course content with a stronger impact on student learning. And it becomes, as you see with the cupcake, a delicious result all around. <laughs> Nina, can I ask a quick question? Yes. Do we have a capacity in Canvas and I just don't know how to use it yet? I, I know how to go on and see like how much time students are spending in that. But do we have the capacity to have a video and have any way to track who's watching the video and who's not? Uh, I've been doing some informal tracking of faculty uh, presentations. And I found that it, it actually replicates what we're seeing in the research. So is there a way for us to do that, though? Yeah. So not I yet. I'd like to know. Uh, there the there is in Kaltura. Sure. There are analytics in Kaltura. Okay. We do not. And Screencast-O-Matic videos go up into Kaltura. So if you're using Screencast-O-Matic, yes, you can still do that with Kaltura. Uh, with VoiceThread, we're upping our license for VoiceThread. And I don't know, but I'm going to be asking whether or not we're going to get analytics or not. I'm hoping with the, with the improved license for voice thread, which is going to be central. Um, we are getting automated captions. And I'm going to ask and see whether or not we can also get analytics. So as we're improving our tools, we're also able to get analytics. This, for Kaltura, it's a fairly new thing, the analytics that we're able to get. And, and the, in central, they've been working with them 
to enhance our ability to get relevant analytics. Can I ask a follow-up question, yeah. Mary? Um, if you had that information, is it going to motivate you to change your form? Like how? Long I think. Do? I think for one, if I had one that really showed me clear-cut stuff that certain timing worked better and all these things, I might be yeah. able to change things. I also, though, have times when. I um, mean, you know, I try to watch the time spent on it, where you have a student in, you know, it's it's kind of like it's it's everybody's fault but theirs that they're not doing well. Yeah. And if you really can track that they're not, yeah. they're not engaging in any of the stuff. I mean, at some point, some of that becomes yeah. a student responsibility. And I think it's it. I find it easier to just make an observation. You don't have to talk to them and say, you know, I noticed. <laughs> you know, yeah, you've, only long spent, you've only spent two hours on, on the course as a, a, on campus right. that's tracking you or whatever, and I'm... I'm, I'm wondering, you know, what your thoughts are as far as what that might be contributing, you know, to your performance, you know, rather than say, you didn't, but I mean, it's, it's like trying to help them kind of walk through, okay, I'm not doing what other people are doing here, and that might be why I'm not doing yeah. real well. So it, it's partly for that, too, but I would say also it would be, it would be, I'd be inclined to change things up if I thought that I at least try it, try to get a different result. I just always worry about, like, a faculty habit, like, going into this, knowing that there are some videos that are you know, probably way too long if they have the time yeah. to recapture that in a different way. The, you know, perhaps. the other thing I have done via um, Nima suggesting, I know when I did quality, a quality matters thing for the policy course, is I had a, a, an interview that I thought the students would be interested in because it was a person who was a, a legislator here in Minnesota running a candidate for governor and that, but really talking the essence of why nurses and asking four specific questions about nurses related to policy. And then what was helpful, though, is even though the interview went on for a bit of time, you know, Nima talked about why don't you, why don't you also have the option, though, to split it out by question. Sure, yeah. So ask the question and then have the seven minutes of the discussion back and forth with that person answering it. And in doing that, when I ask students which they prefer, they do prefer the shorter, the shorter. Because they can do something in 10 minutes, move on, the next 10 minutes they get, they can do it versus right. trying to watch a, you know, 30-minute video. Right. It's those chunking. It's that yeah. chunking of content. Well, and it and it fit a certain question, so exactly. it made sense. It kind of tied it together for just that versus everything kind of getting mushed together. So I do think we might be able to do that even with videos we have, sure. yeah, where I, you could I break them out. I think you can break yeah. even that those big content yeah. sections. Of, we've been doing that a lot more. Mm -hmm. Our challenge. I don't know if they'd ever go away completely because by the time the textbook is printed, it's outdated. Yeah. yeah. And so we're always looking at what is the evidence-based practice, and sometimes it changes quite a bit. So we have to, there has to be a way to communicate that to students. They don't listen to it, I, I can't help them. Yeah. I just wanted to scoot back a little bit to that learning analytics question. And you can look, and I know for sure, like in Moodle, you could, it was pretty clear. Right. People that spend yeah, more time in a class are usually generally, I think they better. generalize and say they tend to do better in the course. But there's a learning analytics um, subgroup or ICAP. I don't know if it's mm -hmm. an ICAP informal community practice. I don't know mm -hmm. if all of you know that terminology yet or on campus yet. But anyway, that's forming. And so one of those things that you can see right now within Canvas is the total time on a class. Right. But I just want to caution you that someone could just log in and right. really hear that you know they're really sure. in their hard. Sure. And some people go in and print everything up and and you know access it in a different way. Right. I know right. that that happens too. But it but it would be nice if on the videos, if we had some way of analyzing, like, who's really looking at them and, and for how videos, long. Yeah, you can you know. see that someone opened it, but you don't know that they really watched right. it. You That's don't right. Know exactly. if also, you also the thing, or, uh, yeah. there is a setting which allows them to download the Kaltura videos, yeah. at which point you don't know how much they've watched. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can deny that download yeah. if you want to make sure you know who's watched what but I mean that's a that's a possible setting we we did a big survey too sorry you guys probably have more stuff to say this we have a survey about of about 600 healthcare students just from January and February this year and I'm still analyzing that data but they're all watching it from their computer they're not even if they do have that given choice of downloading it they're not they're just that's watching it directly yeah. from their computer it seems to be the quickest simplest solution they're not watching it from their phones or watching it from their laptops yeah, it seems that, that, that recent research that just came out from EDUCAUSE indicates that 70% of students are using their computers. So that's still 30% are, are going to their mobile devices. Yeah. But, yes. So um, I'm just going to say um, that the results of, of these wonderful renovated video lectures that are nice and short is that you have students gobbling up your cupcakes of wisdom and enjoy every bite.
Yeah. So thank you all for coming to this workshop. Um, we have the Z-Link, you have the, power, the presentation handout, which also has a Z-Link on it, which goes to all the references. I know you're going to want to read each and every single article. By tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a quiz. Yeah. So <laughs> <I'm gonna tell laughs> you. Thank you very much Thank for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think now you're just going to have to like produce this about no, what's going on. We're going to do an online video. Like, have you come to maybe our office? This is a fire Yeah, I'll come on. I'll think about it. Yeah, 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 I'll think about it. Yeah